Welcome to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point. I'm Li Xin. In this series, I'll dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my guests to compensate for the missing pieces of the puzzle. So join us in real time by sending us your comments or questions via the CGTN page on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube or Weibo. If you're watching this live on the CGTN application, email us at the point with Alex at CGTN.com. Let me know what you think. We start our live streaming every Friday at 11 a.m. Beijing time. So do get in touch and we just might read out your comments. This week, we're looking at media coverage on the new national security law for Hong Kong, which Chinese lawmakers passed on Tuesday. Are these stories fair or do they present a predetermined conclusion? What's missing from these reports? First, here are some facts. China's top legislature on Tuesday unanimously adopted the new law on safeguarding national security in Hong Kong. Chinese President Xi Jinping signed a presidential order to promulgate the law, which went into effect on June the 30th at 11 p.m., one hour before the 23rd anniversary of Hong Kong's return to Chinese rule from the British. Since its introduction at China's annual political meeting in May, the law has been carefully deliberated. The first reading of the law happened between June the 18th and 20th, and the second a week later, starting on June the 28th. Now, with 66 articles and six chapters, the law defines four categories of offenses endangering national, se national security, namely secession, subversion, terrorist activities, and collusion with a foreign country or external elements to endanger national security, and their corresponding penalties, the highest being life imprisonment. According to the new law, the central government shall establish an office for safeguarding national security of the central people's government in the Hong Kong SAR. The law stipulates that its purpose is to ensure the resolute, full and faithful implementation of the policy of one country, two systems and to maintain prosperity and stability in Hong Kong while protecting the lawful rights and interests of residents of the SAR. The law was in response to the widespread unrest which erupted last year, bringing violence and destruction to the city. Many people felt the situation was not sustainable and that something had to be done. Hong Kong SAR Chief Executive Kerry Lam said in a statement about the passage of the law, she says, I'm confident that after the implementation of the new national security law, the social unrest which has troubled Hong Kong people for nearly a year will be eased and stability will be re restored, thereby enabling Hong Kong to start anew, focus on economic development and improve people's livelihood. However, concern, even criticism over the new law has been abundant inside and outside Hong Kong. The Hong Kong Bar Association, for instance, said on Wednesday it is gravely concerned with both the contents of the law and the manner of which it is introduced. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said Wednesday that the newly enacted law was an, F was an affront to all nations and that Washington was taking steps to end special permissions for the Chinese region. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson said on Tuesday, we are obviously deeply concerned about the decisions to pass the national security law in Beijing as it affects Hong Kong. But on the ground, the law has been welcomed by many. In May, 2.9 million local residents put their names on the petition to support the law. And also, a petition, an online petition, gathered 1.7 million local residents' signatures and it was presented at the doorstep of the U.S. consulate in Hong Kong against its interference policies in Chinese and Hong Kong affairs. But when you read many of the headlines about the new law, these numbers are just often absent. And you most likely will see predictions of the end of Hong Kong as we know it. Many articles seem to have already chosen a side in the matter without giving readers a complete understanding of the issue. So now let's go into our media critique section and I'll start with the New York Times. 
On June the 28th, before the law was announced, the paper published the article, China's new national security law looms over Hong Kong. Chinese lawmakers could approve the law within days, threatening to curb free speech and protest in the territory after Euro political turmoil. The article is broken down into four main points. Now, a law to curb opposition in Hong Kong. Beijing imposes security agencies. Many residents fear the law. Western governments object. All four points are negative. There isn't any section dedicated to the background context or the reasons why some people do want some kind of action taken to prevent protests from spinning out of control, among other things. Nowhere do you hear from people whose businesses have been vandalized or lives compromised by the violence that gripped the city last year. The article asserts Chinese top leader Xi Jinping has been impatient to impose control over Hong Kong. Well, that makes it sound as if it is his personal will that the law be enacted, not the collective wish of many on the mainland and in Hong Kong. When the law was introduced, there was thunderous applause in the meeting hall. The law was unanimously adopted, upon which there was again long and loud applause. What might say, well, the Chinese legislature is just a rubber stamp. Well, the law has been deliberated and discussed with opinions from different sectors, both on the mainland and in Hong Kong. By the time it was tabled, it was already built on consensus. So, dear friends in the West, that's the one thing you probably don't understand about the Chinese political system, consensus instead of opposition. Opinions have been solicited, suggestions sorted. The foreign interference, which culminated last year, also helped form this consensus that a national security law was just desperately needed. Then there were the millions of people in Hong Kong who put their names behind the law even before the details came out. Did the New York Times mention this fact? No. Then patient or impatient. I would say the Central People's Government has actually been extremely patient, having waited 23 long years for the region to enact its own national security law without avail. Since the second half of last year, violent offenders in Hong Kong were practically provoking the authorities, both the central authorities and the Hong Kong authorities, wishing that Beijing would crack down with force on the movement, which would make it a big scandal. But Beijing held its ground. In this sense, maybe some people would say Beijing has been even a bit too patient. After all, local life was severely disrupted. People's livelihood suffered. By saying Beijing is impatient to impose control over Hong Kong also misses the point. Hong Kong is part of China. It should be under the control of the central government in the first place. The idea that Hong Kong should enjoy some kind of total freedom or autonomy has misled so many to lose sight of political reality. And the New York Times has done little in this article to help put that record straight. Next, we have an article published by our usual friend, The Guardian, from June the 30th. And the title reads, Controversial Hong Kong National Security Law Comes Into Effect. The first paragraph says, Beijing has imposed a controversial national security law on Hong Kong, giving the Chinese government's sweeping powers over the semi-autonomous territory in a move critics say will crush its freedoms. But anybody who has read about the new law would understand that uh, it only targets four categories of crimes that affect national security. Does that mean sweeping powers? And only under complex cases such as the involvement of a foreign country or external elements will the central government exercise jurisdiction through an office in Hong Kong. Does that mean sweeping powers? We see the usual way of highlighting opposition voices. Why didn't the title say in a move which was supported by 2.9 million local residents? The Henson Index finished the month of June in the best performance so far this year. Why didn't the article say, why didn't the title say, in a move which triggered a rally in the stock markets? Instead, the article features statements from the usual echo chamber of critics, quotes from legal scholars, academics, activists and human rights advocates, all of whom oppose the new law. Whose voices really matter? 2.9 million Hong Kong residents, countless investors, or the few pundits who are most often China critics anyway. Again, 
The article only quoted a short statement from the chief executive, Carrie Lam, in support of the law. Maybe the journalist forgot to reach out to the other side again. The article includes reactions from the international community. Fine. It quotes the EU Council president who says we deplore the decision. But let us not forget on Tuesday during a meeting at the Human Rights Council in Geneva, 53 countries welcomed the adoption of the law, while 27 countries, mostly Western, criticized it. Whose voices should really count? In a joint statement, the 53 countries said non-interference in internal affairs of sovereign states is an essential principle enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations and a basic norm of international relations. We believe that every country has the right to safeguard its national security through legislation and command relevant steps taken for this purpose. Of course, these details would be missing from such report. I wonder why. Finally, we have an article from CNN on June the 30th which, say, which says China passes sweeping Hong Kong national security law. Well, I'll forgive the title, but just to look at the content here, I must say we see a rather comprehensive and relatively neutral report on the facts and more balanced coverage of the analysis with opinions from multiple angles. Carrie Lam's statement is given due weight, not just a snippet against a heap of critics. We also see reactions from critics who fear the law could be used to override existing legal processes and erode the city's civil and political freedoms, and from opponents of the law who say it marks the end of the one country to systems. Well, they say, they say. The article also includes reactions from leaders around the world, many of which are critical, but the article published what they said rather than editorializing. So my whole point is not to condemn critical coverage of China. People are entitled to their opinions, of course. But the point is to call out imbalanced reporting on a topic that clearly has more than just one side. And there's just so much of it. We'll take a short break. You have been watching Headline Buster, our uh, weekly live streaming. I'll talk to my guests right after this short break about media's recovery and uh, why it matters. We have Wang Jiang, postdoctoral researcher from the Institute of Law at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. We have uh, Whitman Hoon joining us from Hong Kong. He's a Hong Kong deputy to the National People's Congress. We also have Professor Benjamin Chow, academic dean of the Paris School of Business and chair professor of Southwestern University of Finance and Economics. <laughs> Making sense of the overwhelming wave of information means cutting through the noise to shine a light on the heart of the story and making room for new perspectives. True understanding means the ability to see events from more than one side. I'm Liu Xin and this is The Point. Welcome back to this edition of Headline Buster with me, Liu Xin. Let me welcome our guests. They are Dr. Wang Jiang from the Institute of Law at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Whitman Hoon, Hong Kong Deputy to the National People's Congress, and Professor Benjamin Chow, Academic Dean of the Paris School of Business and Chair Professor of Southwestern University of Finance and Economics. Gentlemen, welcome to this edition of Headline Buster. So I was um, critiquing at least two stories, one from New York Times and uh, one from The Guardian, although the CNN story this time I deemed to be rather fair. Um, taking a comprehensive look at the situation and look at these reports, let me go to um, Professor Chow first. What do you think are some of the biggest factors that are preventing articles or writers and editors of these papers to um, give a more comprehensive uh, analysis of the different views that are out there? Well, I think uh, vested interests, prejudice, and technologies, uh, quite to the contrary, uh, with this open internet, there is a phenomenon called a organization. Uh, existing beliefs and sometimes uh, wrong beliefs could be reinforced even by uh, very open social media. Uh, one cause of that is through big data. Social media is able to fit you. They understand you, fit you what you wanted to believe and see. So your beliefs are reinforced and reinforced. Uh, if you, unfortunately, if you ask what is the capital of China, 
uh, in some foreign country, you'd be surprised at how many people got it wrong. Some people tend to close their ears if they hear what they hear is very different from their beliefs. China is improving so fast that even surprises scholars like me that uh, who studies it every day. For example, China has put all its citizens out of poverty this year. The scale, the degree, the improvement of the people's life have never happened in history. Let me go to, okay. um, yeah, let me go to Mr. Horn uh, in Hong Kong. Mr. Horn, you live in Hong Kong. You know what the situation is like, and you. Um, also travel around the world, you travel to the mainland. When you are reading these stories, what is uh, striking you the most? Uh, I, I think, um, first of all, I'm, I'm not reading them. I think it's a waste of time, quite frankly. Um, well, last uh, time you I were on the show, that. last time when you were on the show, you said all opinions are cheap. This time you're saying you're not reading the news. We might as well all pack and go home, <laughs> Mr. Hong. No, the thing, the thing is, opinions definitely are cheap, and the problem is these days, um, it's not just one single media, but there's this thing called advocacy journalism, which is really far from the journalism that I used to, uh, uh, you know, understand. Um, why so much advocacy when your duty is to show the facts um, and the truth? And, and, and right now, I mean, Maybe I, uh, we have to be blamed as well because I've never run across any reporter from the uh, Guardians or the CNN or the New York Times. So I, I've, never, I've never met them, uh, even though I'm quite a very active person in Hong Kong. So must be, it must be my fault as well since I, I have not been able to catch their attention. So there's a missing, there's a missing part of their reports, which means they are not really reaching out, or, or they couldn't reach, you know, our people on our side. Why not? Why do you think they're not reaching out, or they couldn't reach? I mean, uh, you have your, your email address, and I'm not just talking about you. We have many people who are, uh, of course, supporting this law. They're all out there, you know. They're all accessible, Mr. Hoon. It puzzles me, but I will... I think maybe there is this mainstream in the West right now, especially led by the U.S. It's called China bashing. Okay, if you look, if you read the news, um, it, it's actually uh, bipartisan support for China bashing, and also um, the way they try to present to their readers, to me, is really um, very often carefully crafted way of presenting um, part of the truth. You know, remember when we used to say uh, we should say the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Mm. But we have been dealing with this kind of half truth for a very long time. Ever since, I think, June last year, we have been reading all this half truth thing. And then, of course, they start to report. You know, I was look, look at, at the CNN and say, well, who, does it, uh, who did they uh, re uh, interview? Oh, Jimmy Lai. Oh, Joshua Wong. Oh, and the MST uh, uh, International, the usual suspects. Okay, how about what, what, what about the others? Are there uh, any other Hong Kong people around? I don't know. I mean, it seems like they only know these three, these two person plus the, uh, uh, this, this famous or infamous uh, NGO, um, you know, backed up by foreign uh, powers. That's, that's so. really, yeah, it's, it's a very stark reality to, to be reminded of, although we are more or less aware of the partiality that has been perpetrated by um, many international media since the outbreak of uh, unrest and protest last year, but to what extent? And, uh, and I think that is very self-defeating because when you are not telling your own people what is really happening in Hong Kong, we are not telling your readers what is really happening in Hong Kong, the whole truth, you are potentially damaging your own future long-term interests as well. Um, Mr. Dr. Wang, what is your take on the kind of um, deliberate or in deliberate efforts not to tell everything about Hong Kong? Well, uh, first of all, I do agree with two gentlemen here. And also I'm thinking is, uh, I think there is a sort of like a catering, uh, those, those media have some sort of like catering to so-called political correctness in Western country here. And uh, to do so, they are somehow to like, 
to creating a monster image of China. It's become of like a part of the opposite side of this political correctness. And that somehow seems like a, just feeding the imagination of some Western people. And that, well, to some extent do help them feeling better, I think. And, but for Hong Kong, I think, as you just mentioned, uh, in the past eight days, nine days, we have like a signature for over 3 million citizens to support their, uh, this national security law. And most of them, some of them are young people. That's never mentioned in those reports. And also I think these signatures are not really only show the support to this new law, but also shows the desire to return to a peaceful life and to have a city under the order and the law. So it is about like protect their own way of the life. You can take a subway to work. You don't need to worry someone stops the train and you can take the airplane on time. You don't need to worry someone just taking over and occupy the airport. And you can express the support to the police officers, but don't need to worry about someone attacking you or you facing online violence. Right. Well, so I all understand. those things are not covered by it. Yeah. Well, I understand that this new law really targets four crimes that are uh, endangering national security. So, Mr. Hong, let, uh, help us yes. understand the difference between uh, a crime that disrupts social order, for instance, if you block the, 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 the proper functioning of a, of a subway carriage, versus uh, you're doing this to endanger national security. What is the nuance here? What is the difference? Well, the major difference is if uh, it's a single act of violence, for example, um, you know, hurting somebody or stopping the NPR, for instance, it's, uh, it's a criminal offense, okay, under, even under the current criminal law in Hong Kong. But the new law talks about terror terrorist activities. I will classify those Occupy Airport and Occupy uh, MTR as terrorist activities because they are doing things um, in violence or sometimes not so violent, but um, based on a political uh, uh, objective, okay, uh, but, and, but hurting, you know, uh, 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 innocent people. So that those will be classified, as, uh, uh, in my opinion, as terrorist activities, and that will be seriously punished by the new law. Whereas in the past, they will be dealt with on a single basis. Um, I mean, the, 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 the main string of this new law, I think, which we like, is number one, it's not just the person in the front who are waving sticks and throwing Molotov cocktails, mm. but also the people who help them, aid them, fund them, promoting them, they, will, they are also liable to this offense. Okay. I mean, I think that is very important. Well, at the end of the day, uh, whether an act is uh, uh, categorizable as a terrorist act or subversion or secession will be decided by, uh, in most cases, judges that are chosen from Hong Kong, right, instead of uh, yes. being dealt with by the central people's government through the Office for Safeguarding National Security in Hong Kong. So uh, a lot of nuances will have to be debated there, and uh, the law also stipulates that nobody will be tried, nobody will, uh, will be presumed guilty before they're proven innocent. So uh, let's take a look at a comment from our uh, online viewers and uh, try to respond to that. Let's take a look at this. So from Ellen Fan, I'm a Hong Konger and I wish to express my unwavering support for the national security law which protects our interests and give us back our law and order. Um, Professor, and okay, it goes on, a government is not accountable to any foreign countries whose only intention for interfering in our own affairs is causing chaos and breaking up our country. Yeah, all right. Uh, a very strong, very clear message there in support of the law. Professor Chow, how do you look at yes. the sentiments of these people? Um, as I said, 2.9 million Hong Kong people gave their names, put their names behind this law, and yet uh, for a lot of people, for a lot of people in the West, politicians or media, it seems that their voices 
just are not important or somehow is skeptical whether they truly support this law or not? I think uh, it uh, potentially reflects a lot of uh, narrow-mindedness or even at some point of brainwashing of uh, some education. Uh, on my Facebook, actually, uh, I have an argument with a friend, close friend, saying that 53 countries supporting China is nothing. You, 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 and they show me, he showed me the list of countries. And I go on to say to him that uh, are these countries not countries? You know, this natural law is being decided uh, and you know promulgated through a very deliberate process. Although it might not be the single uh, way, very uh, uh, the same as the other dominant Western way to uh, to uh, enact such law, but it is a deliberate process. It's not just a decision from a few days, not from one person. Well, you let's look at the paradigms. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's not forget, the United States has uh, 100 also national security legislations. China has a long way to go exactly. <laughs> compared with that. And, uh, exactly. It doesn't prevent London and Tokyo and New York becoming an uh, international financial center. They have their laws. You know. Okay, I just have enough time to put in a last comment this time. Uh, let's see whether he, this person is in support of the new law or not. And uh, from Michael Monguia, does that mean they're going to give all their protesters live in prison? Okay, uh, Mr. Chow, can you take such comments seriously? <laughs> well, I, I think uh, the new law has not mentioned anything about uh, retrospective prosecution. So if you are uh, abide, you abide by the law from from now on, you will not be prosecuted. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I th okay. Yeah. So we're running really out of time, but uh, allow me from a non-professional, legal professional's perspective, even I can see not all prisoners, not all protesters, will be put into uh, life imprisonment. This is just common sense, isn't it? I mean. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to go on with this discussion. Many thanks to Dr. Wang Jiang, many thanks to Whitman Hoon, and many thanks to Benjamin Chow for having joined us on this uh, headline buster. And with that, we come to the end of this special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin, our Friday weekly routine headline buster. Thanks for having followed us. I'll continue to interact with some of you online if you're still there, and I'll try to read some of the comments that you have left. Meanwhile, thank you for having followed us. I'll see you next Friday at the same time.